Okay, looks like we are live, and I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host for today's exciting program. It is a privilege to have Dr. Dan Biddle from Genesis Apologetics here for an exciting presentation on dinosaurs, man, creation, and the Genesis flood. All fun topics. It really doesn't get uh, much better than this. Dan has been generous with his time and his ministry has been a huge blessing to us. Please check the description box of this video for the past presentations that uh, Dan has given on this channel. He's given one on human evolution and also one on the flood. I highly recommend checking out uh, both of them. I've also got my award-winning co-host, Sam, here with me to help with the show and organize audience questions. Sam, my brother, I'm going to hand it over to you for some words of introduction, including a formal introduction of our guest for today. Yeah, thank you. Hey, I'm it's, I'm blessed to be here today. And so, yeah, so um, Dr. Biddle is a behavioral scientist and an HR consultant with a doctorate in industrial organizational psychology. He is a president of Genesis Apologetics, equipping pastors, parents, and students with biblical answers to evolutionary teaching. Daniel has transformed thousands of students in biblical creation and evolution issues and is the author of several creation-related publications. His professional background includes 20 years of experience in expert witness consulting testimony in state and federal cases involving statistical research methods and psychometrics. He maintains an executive role in two HR consulting and test development firms. While Daniel, while Daniel has been a Christian since the age of 11, he says his position on the specific chronology of Genesis was undeclared until around 2011, when the evidence surrounding the fossil record, uh, dinosaurs in particular, flood geology and biblical exegesis led him to the historical position on the Genesis account. Sam, I appreciate the uh, introduction there. And Dr. Biddle, I want to uh, once again thank you for giving us your time for this important program. And again, I want to thank you for all the hard work and just all the content that you've been putting out on, on Genesis Apologetics, which uh, so greatly upholds the faith and upholds the truth of, of young earth creation. So Dan, I want to hand it over to you. If there's anything else you want to add in terms of introduction, and uh, I think we'll get right into the show. Sure. <laughs> you guys, thank you very much for having me. And I think by way of reflection, we were just talking about what a privilege it is <clears throat> for those of us who have trusted in his word, because the word talks about God confides in his servants and in those who are, are fully committed to him. And, uh, and it's amazing that if you come to the Bible and you submit yourself under God's word, under the authority of scripture and regard it with the faith of a child, it can really transform your life when you take the pages of scripture on face value. It's a very humbling and reassuring thing to know that God's word aligns with the history of earth in ways for me that are extremely obvious and in some ways we'll be covering uh, today. So what a what a privilege it is to be to be trusted by the Lord to hold in your heart and your mind the, a true knowledge of, of earth history. It's incredible. Amen. Amen, brother. Great. Well, so should we uh, should we jump on in there? Have you got the, the screen share thing up? And I, I know you said that, that I have a I could actually do over an hour today. And I was so excited because we have so much to <laughs> to cover, you know, because I, I joke with people sometimes and they they come up to me and they want the elevator pitch on dinosaurs. And maybe a, a famous question is, well, were dinosaurs on the ark or do you think dinosaurs were dragons? And right. I honestly say, you know, if, if, you, if all you want is a 30 second answer, I'm going to give you an answer and you're going to think I'm crazy and you're going to walk away and not be satisfied. But if you give me a half hour and I can go out to lunch with you and this is not a brag on me, I have yet to lose anyone on that challenge. If I could say if you if you give me 30 minutes and we can go out to lunch and I can give you some really good qualified reasons why I think dinosaurs lived recently, why I think they were on the ark and why I think they make up the the rumors and legends of of dragons that happen happen afterwards. Every single person I've done that with has come away a believer. And it's not because of me and it's because of the evidence and it's because Amen. the truth is there and people's hearts resonate with the truth. So, uh, but I'm very glad today that we'll have that time 
to really dig in. I think I'll probably go 45, 50 minutes or so. Some of the material I'll go over quickly. Some of the, the stuff I'll drill down, but I have over 100 slides and I'm really kind of combining a, maybe a, a 30 minute talk with a 45 minute talk and uh, we'll go through it today and I'm, I'm real excited. I'm excited as well, uh, Dan. We're definitely not afraid of long presentations and lectures here on this channel. So <laughs> you take Great. your time, brother. I'm looking forward to this. Great. Well, I will pull up my deck here and let me know, can you still see everything if I go down to the second slide now or are we still good? Yeah, it looks great. Looks, looks great. Okay. Well, terrific. I will jump right in, and um, and if you uh, if you want to stop me, just just jump in and tell me tell me to stop. Or if you can't hear anything that's got audio, uh, let me know that as well. But we'll just just uh, punch on through if that sounds good. Sounds good. Good. Okay. So just a little bit about our our ministry. Uh, we we are in the movie production uh, industry. We put out a lot of free stuff too on on YouTube. But all of the the movies that you see are in the, are in the first butt bullet, like Genesis Impact and Debunk Evolution. Uh, they're all available both on YouTube for free as well as Amazon Prime and DVDs as well. But we're big on getting our stuff out there free. I think uh, it's the, the ministry that work that we do and the research that we do is very, very important. At least it is to me. And so we want to make sure it gets out there free. We have a, a significant YouTube subscriber base, about 133,000 subscri subscribers. Uh, I think we get about 400,000 um views a month i think it's right in that range at least last month it was up about four hundred thousand views um about uh, pushing almost thirteen thousand million views total so we keep putting out new content in that area we also uh, give a lot of talks uh, locally to a, a, a lot of local christian private christian schools in our area we have uh, church presentations that we give as well, and we have an annual conference. You can go to g1conference.com, and if you live in the Sacramento area, we would encourage you to, to go over to that conference. It's going to be on March 4th. We're doing it in conjunction with um, David Reeves and ICR. The president of ICR is going to join us, Randy Galuza. And it's a one-day conference on a Saturday in Rockland, California. We will also be sharing that uh free on our website channel uh, or on actually on YouTube probably a week after we give the, the conference. So just by way of resources, and again, these are all free. We're not really, we're not trying to sell anything here. You can go to debunkevolution.com. That's a great program for fifth to 10th graders, especially students who are going through things like life science classes, earth history classes, uh, biology. We take the top 10 pillars of evolution and address them in that program with a couple different actors. It's all video-based learning. Then if you have older students, 11th grade and up, go to sevenmyths.com where we take seven of the top false teachings that students are going to encounter in high school or college, even in some Christian colleges, and address them uh, with biblical evidence. So that's an older uh, student res resource. Uh, all students and, and Christians, we would encourage you to get uh, this book as well, uh, called Answers to the Top 50 Questions about Genesis, Creation, and the Flood. You can also download this book free just by going to our website, slash uh, FAQS. And you can see all the Q and A's there. They have a bunch of videos associated with them, and you can download the book as a, pre as a PDF free as well. Um, we have over 100,000 people that have downloaded our mobile app. Just go to the iTunes Store or the Apple or, or the Google Play Store and type in Genesis Apologetics, and you can uh, download our free mobile app there. And it will queue up for you and play a lot of the same content that's on our YouTube channel. And then this year, we're coming out with a movie called The Ark in the Darkness. It's going to be out in 700 theaters around the, the U.S. It's, going to, it's been picked up by Fathom. Uh, we're, we're working with them to get it in the theaters. And we already have a book out called The Ark in the Darkness um, that is available that will include a lot of the underlying research and knowledge about, the, about Noah's Flood that, we've, um, that will be uh, unpacked in that movie. About 20 minutes of the movie is going to be uh, dedicated to the science side of Noah's Flood, and we'll be covering some of the highlights of that today. But if you just go to noahsflood.com, you can see that website uh, there and sign up for uh, updates about the movie and the book. Let's talk quickly about dinosaurs. A, a lot of Christians who have not yet been awakened to the truth of Earth history and the fact that Genesis is a real history book, 
they're oblivious to this, which is which is really sad to me because dinosaurs are leveraged by the world and by the powers that be to teach millions of years. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, because millions of years are not in the Bible and people who read the Bible understand that. Um, and, and it's used as a platform for pushing the foundation of evolution. And if you ask any evolutionist, if you ask 100 of them, they, they, you'd get 99 different opinions on how evolution happened and when it happened. There's a lot of disagreement about that. But 100 out of 100 secular evolutionists would say they all need millions of years. They need hundreds of millions of years for evolution to evolve as they think it evolved over time. So it's it's a foundational issue. It's not a side issue. I could even argue it's a gospel issue because if the enemy can trick people about this, he can trick people about other things. And 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 I just challenge people to say, well, millions of years or, or old earth, young earth, it's not really a big deal. I challenge them and say, explain to me the gospel, but don't quote Genesis. And you can't do it. It's really impossible. You have to go back to a garden, original sin, and a fall. And if those things didn't exist, the gospel's based on a fairy tale and on a myth. So these are real concrete issues that have to be wrestled through. And of course, the world leverages dinosaurs and the fascination that people see when they look at these dinosaurs. And he uses that to base the idea of millions of years on, which really goes against the gospel. So it starts early with kids and they're taught things like life through time, evolutionary activities. Uh, it's used as school and textbooks and everything. And it all started with the Big Bang, the origin of the earth, you and everything else. All of this is based and predicated on millions of years, billions of years ago. We see all these children's books and student books, amazing evolution, the journey of life. And it's pitched as this long, slow journey where, you know, Father Time with its cousin natural selection and mutation generated the idea of vertical evolution where we go from goo to the zoo to me and you over millions of years. That's the whole thing that, that's, uh, that it's based on. So we would argue that dinosaurs are ex extremely important when it comes to the Bible and fitting into this, this worldview because it's a challenge to God's word and to God's character to say that the Bible doesn't say anything about dinosaurs or it, it doesn't have uh, any credible ideas about, about dinosaurs. So if you don't believe that the Bible talks about dinosaurs being created on days five and six, uh, like land animals and sea animals were, were, were created, then when did they develop? And, and did God use some long, slow, clumsy, random, murderous process to bring about life on earth? Because that's what people are believing. If you don't believe in a young earth and, and the truth of scripture, you're ultimately saying that our all designing, all powerful God used this long, slow, random, murderous process to go from, you know, from reptiles and mammals and everything else, eventually leading to the human line that started branching out from, from hominids some 4 million years ago. Is that really what God did? Or did he start out everything perfect and then we messed it up? So we can now blame cancer and bloodshed and, and shortening lifespans on our original sin and not on God. So it does malign God's character to say that he didn't create in a way that he created. So I really don't view these as secondary issues. I think these are fundamental because they deal with the character of God. So if you take a literal interpretation of Genesis, you have six perfect days of creation, uh, earth rotation days, and the, at some point you have the fall that happened with Adam and Eve. And the effect of that fall was exactly what God says, you will surely die. So that sin brought in death to the world. And as a result of that sin bringing death, it also brought thorns and thistles. So God cursed the earth and cursed vegetation. So death and suffering are brought into the world as a direct result of Adam and Eve's sin and as a, as a, as a, a repercussion of exactly what God says was going to happen if they went against him in that way. But if we take a non-literal interpretation of Genesis, then we have millions of years. And at some point we have Adam and Eve and different, um, you know, different Christians that have gap theory or day age or progressive creation, whatever they're going to believe, will have some different uh, realization of when they think Adam and Eve came on earth. 
Then at some point after that, we have the fall, which brought in sin. But then we have millions of years of death, suffering, and bloodshed on the record, in the fossil record, before Adam and Eve were even here to bring that result to the earth. That's a huge problem scripturally. And we would also say, the evolutionists would say that they've got thorns in rock layers dated to 200 million years ago. So how do we have thorns and thistles in the fossil record 200 million years ago before Adam and Eve were here to bring about the curse that led to thorns and thistles? Big problem uh, theologically that would really make the fall and sin having no effect, and it would make death and suffering God's fault and not ours. So these really do have some significant implications to, I, not, I would say, not only your theology, but your worldview. So uh, those are some of the reasons why it's important to understand that man's word talks about evolution, which is time eventually uh, leads to death. And through that process, that funnel of natural selection eventually leading from rat-like creatures all the way up to four quadrupeds and then bipeds. And then we have, but God's word says that, you know, sin uh, actually led to death. And it wasn't the time that that led to death. So two completely different ways of viewing the world with the world saying millions of years, death, suffering, bloodshed eventually led to man. But the Bible's got it the opposite way. It says God created man, breathed him out of, out of, uh, out of the, you know, breathed life into his spirit and drew him from the dust or the clay of the earth and drew Eve from his side. And it was his choice and, and Eve's choice to, to sin. And the result of uh, that sin was death, suffering, and bloodshed. So let's look at the dinosaur Bible timeline with this in mind. If you take the Genesis genealogies that are described as an errant scripture in Luke chapter 3, and you join that with Genesis chapter 5 and 10, you have three chapters is really all you need to map back the genealogies that go back about 6,000 years of history. So dinosaurs were created as land creatures on day six. Then at some point we have the fallen corruption that happened. About 1,656 years after creation, we have the flood. And about 85 different kinds of dinosaurs were preserved on the ark. Sometimes the estimate's a little bit more. Sometimes it's a little bit less. I believe AIG's perspective is about 85 different uh, dinosaurs at the family level were on board the ark. After those 85 dinosaur kinds got off of the ark about four and a half thousand years ago, they went uh, extinct very quickly. Most of them went extinct. Some of them were hunted. They were hungry. The food systems were much, much different. They weren't equipped for a post-flood world. Those, the large varieties probably went out extinct uh, very quickly. Theropods and pterosaurs were probably the longest lasting dinosaur kinds. And I believe they're probably both extinct now. But there's plenty of sightings and legends and rumors and myths about theropod types of dinosaurs and pterosaur types of dinosaurs all the way through the medieval times. And then they tapered after that pretty quickly. So after the flood, we've got, you know, world version number two. It's a harsh climate. Mass extinctions are happening with the Ice Age going on. And most dinosaur varieties went extinct pretty quickly. So if you look at just one chapter in the Bible, Job chapter 40, we have not, not a kind of good, but a great description of a perfectly fitting sauropod dinosaur. In fact, if you, you go through and you can read this, this chapter on your, on your own time, I've read it in maybe a dozen different Bible translation versions. I, we've, we've drilled into the Hebrew of it and talked with experts in Hebrew. It's talking about a sauropod dinosaur. There's really no question about it. And it's not talking about a sauropod dinosaur in some metaphorical way. Here's why. Here's just a few things that we're going to pull out and take a look at. It says that its tail swayed like a cedar tree, and cedar trees are probably 30 to 50 feet tall at the time that that was written, and only a sauropod dinosaur has a tail that can, that can sway like a cedar tree. And then the Bible says what strength it has in its loins, what power or in the muscles of its belly. Well, lots of creatures have strong bellies and strong loins, but nothing like a sauropod dinosaur. 
And then the Bible says the sinews of its thighs are closely knit. Its bone, bones are like tubes of bronze. And did you know that if you take a sauropod's femur and do a cross-sectional cut on it, it absolutely looks like a tube of bronze. It's got a circle on the outside of the hard enamel style bone and then a spongy marrow bone on the inside. So it's absolutely like a tube in its design. And its ribs, the Bible says, are like rods of iron. And sure enough, if you look at the paleontology, uh, paleontologists have looked at the ribs of sauropod dinosaurs, and they're the only bones in its body that are fully ossified. They are, in fact, hard as iron because they have to hold in the girth of that creature. So they're fully ossified like rods or bars of iron. And of course, a sauropod could stand in a raging river that would not alarm it and it would be secure in it, and even though a river like the Jordan in a flood stage would surge into its mouth. That's just like six of the 13 characteristics. But when you go through all of these systematically, um, you can compare these descriptions in Job chapter 40 against a, a behemoth sauropod dinosaur perfectly fits all 14 descriptions, does not fit a hippopotamus and does not fit a crocodile. Although those last two creatures have been used by all kinds of people, including even uh, study Bible notations to say, well, maybe it was a hippo, maybe it was a croc, uh, definitely not. It was a sauropod dinosaur. And God gets the credit for doing this. God says, Consider behemoth, which I made along with you. It is the chief of all of my works. That's God, the maker of heaven, saying, this is the biggest, baddest land creature I ever made. And sauropods take, uh, take that title very, very well. Some of the biggest, uh, biggest ones, titanosaurs, there's um, all kinds of different species, Argentinosaurus, a dreadnoughtus that, that was recently discovered. These creatures can be up to 120 feet long, that's six freeway lengths across, and weigh 80, 90, or some say even more than 80 or 90 tons. They're huge creatures, and if it just spins around in one circle, it's got a 250-foot kill zone. So there is no getting next to this creature, just like God says in Job chapter 40. It's unapproachable by anyone but its maker. You can't even get near this creature. Here's what its femur uh, would look like. That's uh, that's a gigantic bone. Probably the biggest bones in the world are, are behemoth femurs. There's a sauropod footprint, just a massive, massive creature. And here's a guy standing next to a sauropod leg. What design do we see here? We see the, the hip structure, and beneath that is one solid femur bone that's like a tube of bronze that goes to two, that goes to three or four, that goes to five. What a fascinating engineering feat that is and a way to do weight displacement. If you were an engineer, you could not improve on that system going from a hip socket to one to two to three or four to five into some toes. It's a perfect way to disperse weight of an 80 ton creature that was capable of walking around on, on dry land. Here's what a Diplodocus looks like when you get up close. This is at a, at a museum. And when you zoom in, you can see these chevron bones right underneath its neck. And these chevron bones were like chain links whereby you could have muscles and tendon and ligament connections joining them all together in a flexible way so that this animal could bend over and take a drink or eat. And without that amazing design system, it would choke, suffocate, or drown and as, its, as its neck would fold in half. This is an amazing uh, design feature of this creature. And some people that have spent their, their entire adult life studying these creatures, uh, Dr. Uh, Waddell, a sauropod expert, says, you know what? It's really like the design of a suspension bridge because you can't have a long neck without a long tail and you can't have a long tail without a long neck. There's this offsetting that happens when you have compressive loading and tension loading. You gotta have those two things to displace the weight. It's an incredible feat of engineering and it's, it's uh, neck system is designed like this double booms you know, uh, construction uh, uh, device here. So just incredible stuff, amazing, amazing design. And it can go on and on and on as you look at these creatures. But one of the things that I love most about this is a recent discovery that came out over the last 20 years or so 
that they're learning that these bones in the, the vertebrae, the higher you go up the neck, the more and more pneumatic they are, meaning the more filled with air they are. So here we see a four and a half foot wide a sauropod vertebrae, and 90% of the higher ones up the neck would be filled with air like styrofoam. So you see one here on the screen that's a sauropod vertebrae, and you see the white parts are the hard enamel, and then the yellow parts I'm about to fly in would be the air pockets in this area. So you obviously couldn't have a fully ossified sauropod vertebrae way, way up its neck. It would weigh hundreds and hundreds of pounds. It'd be too heavy to get around. God knew this, and he programmed in its DNA the way so that the higher up the neck you get, the less and less support structure you need And as far as being a hardened bone. And the more and more, they, uh, the less and less weight you could support as, as you went up there. So these higher, higher up vertebrae were filled with air. They were, they were like styrofoam. Just an amazing uh, design feature. And of course, Job chapter 40, verse 17 says that he moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. And sure enough, paleontologists have studied the femur and the tendons and the muscles and the linking points of these creatures and have learned that it would necessarily have to sway its tail as it walked. And no one has ever found a sauropod tail skid mark on the ground. So they're definitely walking along. We have lots of sauropod trackways, but they're walking along and they're holding their tail up. And as they're walking, they're swaying their tails, just like the Bible said that they would, because that's exactly where the muscle connecting points would have been pulling up their tail. So they would, if you walk left and right, it's going to create a tail sway. Fascinating stuff. So let's go next into looking at a dinosaur's and the flood and the bible here is very clear that all flesh died that moved on the earth every creeping thing everything that god put his life in everything that was on dry land it died during the first inundation stage of the flood which was 150 days most creationists believe it, uh, that the flood if you extrapolate from genesis 6 through 9 and you look at the diary there of the flood uh, the zenith happened at about one uh, day 150. So it took that long for the flood to summit. There are some key verses that talk about that, like Genesis 7, 11, that says on the same day were all, not some, but all of the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. So that one key verse says two things happened. All the fountains of the great deep broke open and the windows of heaven were open. Then you can track the progress of what happened after this. The catastrophic rifting and the fountains were open for 150 days, but the torrential rain stopped after about 40. So the key is the flood started on the ocean floor because it was the fountains of the great deep. We know it was a worldwide flood because the Bible says 15 cubits upward or about 22 feet did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. All the mountains were covered. Then on Genesis 8, it says, and the waters receded continually from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the waters decreased. Then, and that's talking about the second half of the flood. And the ark rested in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. And the 10th month on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So this doesn't read like some mythical book. It's not like the Epic of Gilgamesh or the many other ancient Near Eastern flood myths that we have. This is reading like someone's diary who was on board an ark when this stuff was going down. They recorded the days, the times, the month, the happenings. It's all there for us to read right in God's word. These six guys in the 1990s got together a team of, of six PhDs, and I believe uh, with, with really 100% surety, I have no doubts about this, these guys figured out the, the mechanisms that were involved in the flood, and I think, I, I believe it 100%, because science and geology aligns perfectly with their theory, in my opinion, and as well as scripture. So their, their models based upon scripture and are based upon what we can clearly see on earth today. And here's what they came up with. They said, look, as the fountains of the great deep broke open, we have underwater rifting. As magma came up 
breached the open floor, started linear rifts all over the world. We have 40, a network of 40,000 miles of this rifting that, that went on around, around the world. And Dr. John Bumgardner has modeled it. He's used actual earth science evidence to come up with a model uh, that many people have used for oil exploration and coal explor exploration. He was trained, he was a, a you know, graduated top of his class in geophysics from UCLA uh, decades ago. And this model, this computer simulation software called Terra has been used by all kinds of secular corporations. And here's what it shows. It shows the breakups of the continents from a Pangaea-like formation into their current places that we have them today. And there's lots of evidence that we know that this actually happened that we'll go through as we uh, go through here. So first we have the linear rifts. 40,000 mile system that goes all over the world, about 1.6 times it loops, loops around. You can go anywhere on earth and see where these things are today. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is of course the largest one. That's a 10,000 mile tear right in the middle of, uh, of the ocean there. Uh, as we can see on the, on the screen where it stopped, it's a huge rift system. And this is why we have catastrophically buried dinosaurs all over the world, as well as billions of other creatures, both sea life and land life, buried together because of this rifting and the related tsunamis and volcanisms that came as a result of it. So here's what the Mid-Atlantic Ridge looks like. This is a 10,000 mile section. And you can see on the right, if you take what's called a bathymetric map, you take the earth and remove all the water, that's quite a pronounced scar that goes all the way down earth, down the, uh, the earth there. You can see the perpendicular scar stretch marks, if you will, as this thing happened. That is one of the major fountain systems that broke open four and a half thousand years ago that pushed these continents apart and then resulted in the catastrophic burial of animals and the pushing up of about a, a mile on average of sediment on top of the continents. It was responsible for a lot of that, and that's one of the most pronounced ridge uh, rift systems that you can see. So the flood mechanism happened with the magma came up like this and breached these linear rifts and started what's called seafloor spreading. So as the magma came up from underneath the earth, it, it breached all these linear rifts, and as it came up, it generated new seafloor and rapidly spread that seafloor apart on each side going bi-directionally at a speed of about five miles per hour. You can see when that new magma is coming up, it's generating the seafloor, then it's pushing the continents apart. And then when the new seafloor hits the continents, it binds against the land continents, builds up tension just like it does today, like that huge earthquake we just had in, in, in Japan where the seafloor slipped 60 feet, creating a huge tidal wave that came up on the, on the, on this, on the, uh, the land. Same thing's happening here during the flood in cycles and in succession. As the land goes up, uh, it builds up right underneath the, the, uh, the, the land continent there. So you see the new seafloor diving down going underneath the earth, it grabs, it builds up tension, and then it binds, and then it releases. When it releases, it sends a tsunami up onto land and another one out to sea. And this is repeating over and over again during the flood for the first uh, three mega sequences, ending with the Zuni, when the, the flood, uh, you know, zenith at about one uh, day 150. It was this repetitive cycle system of tsunamis that was responsible for burying these massive dinosaur graves all over the place. Here's a 14 mile system in the middle of America filled with dinosaurs that represents a, you know, a million square miles, 14 states, three partial countries. You can't do this slowly, gradually over millions of years. And I've got some good reasons why that we'll be covering next. But here's the result of those tsunamis coming up on land, a huge, huge swath of land with tons of clustered animals fleeing for their lives as they were catastrophically and, and, uh, and rapidly buried. 1,800 miles long, 1,000 miles wide. This is not some slow, gradual die-off from evolution. This was rapid, catastrophic burial because think about it. These creatures in the middle of America, they're not buried 
in just ash from some mysterious asteroid that dropped, you know, the Chicxulub asteroid that evolutionists claim wiped out the dinosaurs 2,000 miles south of this, they're buried in mud, sand, and ash, which was would obviously be caused from the processes that I just showed you. The, the uh, Chicxulub asteroid would have missed. Some people have run simulations about where that asteroid landed, because if you go into any museum, they say, hey, the dinosaurs uh, died off because of the Chicxulub asteroid that landed on the Yucatan Peninsula, um, and they think that was 65 million years ago. But it would have pushed up some water and some tsunamis. It would have buried part of the then existing Texas and on up a little bit, uh, meters high, but it wouldn't have killed 14 states worth of dinosaurs thousands of miles away, and it certainly wouldn't have buried them under 100 feet of mud. This is what we see in the Hell Creek Formation of Montana. These creatures are buried under 10, 50, 100 feet of mud, and it's not something that an asteroid kerplunking you know, 2,000 miles away would have done. Here's a simulation as it rolls. You see the Chicxulub asteroid hit. The water comes up a little bit on the south side of America. There's no way it's going to bury North America filled with dinosaurs and bury them under 100 feet of mud. Uh, that's a nice theory, but doesn't work. This theory works much, much better when you have these tsunamis bringing up, you know, the tsunamis bring up hundreds of feet of mud and sediment and debris and burying these creatures in exactly the type of matrix we see them buried in today. So we have all of this water coming in. If you can see California now would have been, would have been buried by this water. It's coming in from the west, moving up east on, on land. And it's, it's these repeating tsunamis that are bringing up and leaving layers of earth and sediment and debris. And we can see these layers all over the place in Montana, the Morrison Formation. We see these striped layers of these repeating tsunamis coming up, retreating, coming up, retreating. It exactly fits the model of catastrophic plate tectonics. Here's yet more proof for this. If you look at the study of dinosaur taphonomy, which is a study of how and when these creatures died and the, and the matrix that they're buried in, well, they're buried in three different materials, mud, sand, and ash. What type of process could have done that? Catastrophic plate tectonics is really the only way to describe how these creatures would be buried in mud, sand and ash. The ash is from the volcanism because when you have the newly spreading seafloor comes up and it binds against the land and it dives under, it creates a lot of volcanic activity and volcanic systems and hazards all along the coastal system that's bellowing up tons and tons and tons of ash. You can see this in the Independence Dyke Swarm in Southern California. It's a 370 mile long linear rift that's in Southern California. You can go see it today. And geologists believe it, it emitted more ash than any other system in history and buried about half of America in ash. And that's exactly why we see uh, these creatures today buried in these three substances, mud, sand, and ash. So here's how the first two substances are created. You've got the new seafloor diving under, causing these tsunamis that are coming up as the seafloor binds, creates a tension and releases. The new mud and ash is coming up and the ashes or the mud and sand is coming up and the ashes from all the, the seafloor diving down, causing these, uh, these uh, volcanic systems to burst out along the seacoast ranges that's spouting out all kinds of ash into the air and burying these creatures in, a, in these three different products, mud, sand, and ash. Here's yet more proof. Uh, just take a look at the Allosaurus species. All of the Allosauruses that we have in North America are buried in these little uh, mint blue circles you can see here on your screen. That's where all of them are in the states as represented. This is from PaleoDB, the paleontology database. You can go look it up for yourself. That's where all these creatures are buried. Now let's fly in the sauropods. Look where they're buried very close to where these Allosauruses were buried, almost like something was hitting both of them at the same time. Allosaurus, sauropods, stegosaurus. They're all living in similar regions and zones according to their species, according to their kinds. You fly in all three, and these a lot of these circles overlap. 
it's millions of years can't explain this guys they're in the same region when these waters came up and hit them and buried a species-wide extinction event in the same place where other big species went extinct what on earth can do that you can't have one asteroid 2000 you know miles away responsible for bringing these things in mud sand and ash in some cases under 100 feet of mud so uh, it was an you know a species-wide event if we need yet more evidence, look at fossil correlation here. And fossil correlation simply says that the same uh, types of species are buried across multiple different continents. So you see here a couple of examples of some species that you can actually find on all four continents, some on two, some on three. Well, that applies to Noah's flood also. If you go to PaleoDB and look up these, these Cretaceous level fossils, you can see these two continents, which we know perfectly match together. And look at that. If we draw the circles around these, these, each one of these tiny green circles and yellow circles represents not hundreds, not thousands, but either tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these uh, of, of fossils that are buried in these regions. So if we see what's happening here, we see that these continents were once pushed together. Then we see a rift happen right in the middle of the screen. There's a tear that goes down, down in the middle all the way down to the south side of your screen here. It gets ripped apart, and the same exact species are found now in these areas, which are now separated by thousands of miles. So they're living together. They get ripped apart. And when you do fossil correlation, it was the same habitat the same biosphere, the same types of creatures and plants and everything else were living in these regions. You, you can go back and correlate it and find out, yeah, it used to be the same habitat, but here's the key. They're both now, the, these creatures are buried in the mud that killed them. You can find brothers now on one side and his sister is on the other side, 2000 miles apart. Same creatures, same habitat, rapidly and catastrophically pulled apart and buried by the flood. Now let's uh, integrate a, a, just a one quick new slide that I have here, and hopefully you guys can hear this. I, I'm not going to endorse this guy's, uh, this, this channel or any of his other videos, but there's been some recent discoveries about some runoff flood markers in the Sahara. Uh, and this guy does a great job at explaining it. It's about one minute long. And uh, Donnie, if you can let me know if you hear this video, that would be great. Let's give it a shot. Yeah, I can't. I can't hear it. You're gonna have to hang on for one minute. Okay. Or maybe move something. Donnie said he'll be right back. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at it from my end. The only reason we might not be able to hear it, Dan, yeah, is your uh, share audio might not have been clicked. Okay. Uh, you know what? Let's go ahead and leave the audio off, and I'll just narrate it through as, as we go uh, look at this. What you're Perfect. seeing here is a slideshow of all kinds of flood runoff indicators from the Sahara Desert. Isn't that amazing? Look at this. We, it looks like someone mopped these continents as the flood is receding. So if you guys just go to this YouTube video called When You Realize the Sahara Proves a Great Flood. Again, um, I know this guy does believe in, in uh, a timeline that's outside of the Bible, and he, he probably believes in millions of years. But he's right on this one minute snapshot that I have here, where if you zoom in, just go to Google Earth and look at North Africa, there's some very, very obvious flood runoff scar marks that are rushing right off of, 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 uh, of Africa. And creationists would put this in what's called the Tejas mega sequence, where the waters were rushing off of the flood or off of the continents in the very last stages of the, of the flood. So great video. I just uh, just showed you guys about a minute's worth of clips there. But if you want to watch the whole thing, you can go check out this guy's video called When You Realize Sahara Proves a Great Flood Actually Happened. But again, I can't endorse anything else on this guy's video, but he did a great job in this one minute showing some excellent pictures from satellites and Google Earth on how the flood runoff might have looked like after Noah's flood. Okay, moving on, one of my favorite topics. In fact, um, I I used this evidence to, uh, to uh, 
really have some good impact on some professors in the secular world because if you really drill into this one topic we don't have much time to go into it now but if you spend time drilling into dinosaur soft tissue and you just step back and realize let's think about this for a minute since the 1950s there's been 120 peer-reviewed science journals not 10, not 20, but a, over 120 from secular journals that have substantiated biomaterials, soft materials, and not only dinosaur bones, but in uh, tissues in bones that have been dated all the way back to the Triassic period. And it's not just one type, it's multiple different types. It's proteins, infects, and histones, and, and blood vessels, and blood cells, and osteocytes, and collagen. All types of soft tissues we're finding in dinosaur bones today. But that's not what the world wants you to know. If you go to some of the, the famous um, museum videos that are out there, and you look at the, the common narrative, the popular narrative about dinosaur bones and fossils, they'll say things like, well, hey, the fossils are teeth and bones that have changed into stone. That's what kids are taught. There's these videos you can go and watch called How Are Fossils Made? Here's a, here's a quote from one that says, minerals in the ground and groundwater surrounding the skeleton slowly replace the bone and form a fossil. Now, that's true from a general sense. Permineralization happens when groundwater leaches into the, into the, the, the bone material and then will eventually replace it and, and you call it a, a hardened fossil or a completely permineralized fossil. We have several of these, but we also have dinosaur bones that are still bones. Here's what the leading um, museum video says. And this is one called How Do Dinosaurs Fossils Form from the Natural History Museum. They say, quote, while this was happening, the water seeped into the bones and left behind minerals, turning the bones into stone. Well, then, if that's the case, why do we have 120 peer-reviewed science journals since the 1950s and peer-reviewed secular science journals that have substantiated soft, squishy, pliable tissue and biomaterials that's still present in dinosaur bones. In fact, this got to be such a stink because the, the big one is collagen. There was so much controversy over it that they had to come out with a, a study just a few years ago that substantiated that the collagen that they're finding in dinosaur bones was not um, makeup that they thought was contaminating because it was falling off of the lab technician's face into the bone material. So they thought initially just it's got to be contamination. Then they thought, well, maybe a modern creature died on top of the dinosaur and leached its collagen into the dinosaur bones. No, they finally gave up on those explanations because they've now proven at the molecular organic level that the collagen that they're finding in dinosaur bones is organic to the creature that they're studying it with, uh, studying it in. So the collagen has a known half-life and a known shelf life. Some scientists say, well, collagen, which is a soft pliable part of bone, can last maybe 10 to 30,000 years. That seems reasonable to me. Some scientists will push it out to 100,000 years. And there's one study that will go out to 300,000 years. And then in, in ideal conditions, they'll say, well, maybe 900,000 years. But that's the most that any peer-reviewed science journal is willing to take at this time. There's been five studies on it. One study will go as far out as 900,000 years and say, yep, that's what we think. That's the longest collagen class. If you take it in a bone and stick it out in the mud for almost a million years, it could last up to that, to that uh, long. But why do we still find it in dinosaur bone after dinosaur bone after dinosaur bone? This is the list of the long study of 120 some studies that have been shown. Again, uh, the uh, ICR keeps this list. It's the biggest discovery of the last couple of, uh, of decades. It's amazing. It just goes on and on and on. And we, we can take a triceratops horn and demineralize it, put it under a microscope and still stretch it. It's still pliable. Here's a clip, clip from Mark Armitage. This is on the Is Genesis History movie. 
look at this. You can pull and stretch a dinosaur horn bone. It doesn't, to me, look like it's 65 million years old. It looks like it's 4,500 years old from a creature that was stuffed in mud uh, four and a half thousand years ago from, from the flood. We also have blood cells that are lined up like a train inside of blood vessels. And even the leading, the founder of the leading dinosaur museum in the world, the Royal Terrell Museum says, quote, usually most of the orig original bone is still present in a dinosaur fossil. So why is it that you have to dig and find leading experts like this who are secular, who say, yeah, these dinosaur bones that we're finding up here in Canada, at least, they're still bones. But when you go to the Smithsonian and watch the Natural History Museum video, it says they're hardened rocks because they're too ancient to be original bone. So you're not getting the, the full story here. Here's a clip from a museum that says, you know, this is a real dinosaur bone. And although it's 69 million years old, it's still original bone and not rock. Look at that. So they have a complete admission here. That is a bone, not a hardened a rock fossil. But here's collagen, what it looks like underneath the microscope. And that's the, the soft, pliable part of a bone. And, uh, and you know, the studies say that the, that collagen picture that you say there, they say is six or 75 million years old. But then all these studies come out and say, well, collagen can't last for more than 100 million years. So if collagen should all be gone within a million years, how in the world could it last 65 times longer than that? And obviously it, it can't. It doesn't, the, the, the evidence doesn't fit the worldview of the people pitching it. Uh, it fits our worldview perfectly because we believe that it's it's miraculous enough that you can still find collagen after four and a half thousand years. But science says it's impossible to last 65 million years, yet they have and they have no way of reconciling that. So I think when you take a look at these 16 bioorganic materials, including the last two on your screen there that you see, those are new additions, which are, get this, dinosaur collagen and nerve cells. Those are the two latest finds that they found. These findings match our worldview perfectly. You've got a flood some four and a half thousand years ago, and it's amazing that these materials have been preserved this long, but they certainly can't last for 65 million years. So next, let's take a look at evolution uh, theory when it comes to dinosaurs. This is out of a book called The Dinosaur Encyclopedia. And you see uh, all of these lines that they're using to infer how they think the evolutionary tree of dinosaurs happen. You go back and you see the starting of some ancestral dinosaur, then it goes off to all of these nodes. And then it shows this eventual progression of dinosaurs as they kind of flowered out and evolved into all these different varieties. But did you know that they say that the yellow lines indicate the solid actual fossil evidence and all of the gray that I just took away are theories. They're inferential, and they admit this in the book. They say all of the gray is guesswork. So when you take away the guesswork and the desired theories, all you have is the actual fossil data. And if you remove the idea of millions of years, you just have a whole bunch of species that showed up that were created on day six of creation that went extinct in the different um, sequences of the flood. You see the Jurassic areas were buried first in the flood sequences, then followed by the Cretaceous period of the flood, which were buried last. So you take away the theory and you're left with just the dinosaurs that were created. Here's one that even proves that this is in the Chicago Field Museum. Dr. Carl Werner did this work, went around and interviewed over 60 paleontologists and said, where are the transitions? Can you please name them for me? And he found zero. These paleontologists would say things like, yeah, well, we have 287 sauropods in the fossil record that we've discovered. Well, where's their ancestors? Where's their transitions? Zero. Look at T-Rexes. They say, well, we've got 78 T-Rexes in the fossil record. Where's your transition? What led to a, a, a T-Rex? Don't have any, don't have anyone. They're not willing to, to stake their credibility on trying to find these transitions because they're not there, because God made them. They didn't have some common ancestor and they didn't evolve from one creature to the next over vertical evolution. God made them, breathed them into existence on the, on the sixth day of creation. 
Let's just give them a chance, though, and look at one if at one of these potential nodes. So they say that they have 242 armored plant eaters like Ankylosaurus or Stegosaurus. Then below that, they've got Ceratopsians, and they believe that the Ceratopsians and the Ankylosaurus are, are, would go back for millions of years onto a branching node where somehow they evolved from some previous uh, uh, predecessor. So let's look at these two creatures. You have Ankylosaurus and Triceratops. Well, these creatures look kind of different. They have really different tails. They have really different armor systems. Ankylosaurus has got some great armor. Triceratops has nothing. And one of them has two massive horns on the top of his head and a huge eight foot shrill on the top of his head, big, big armor system there. And the Ankylosaurus doesn't. These two things don't look at all uh, similar. They look very, very, very different. So it's hard to even pass from a, a smell test that these creatures are somehow evolving from some predecessor, especially when you ask them, what is it? Show me the creature in a dinosaur encyclopedia that you would believe these creatures evolved from, and they're not willing to do it. They come out and say, we're not sure. The story doesn't get any better because if you look at some recent findings, now they're finding dinosaur transitions out of place. They're finding what these creatures supposedly evolved from buried deeper than creatures that were along the evolutionary tree up on top. So now the burial order that they're finding these creatures in is reversed. How does that work for evolution theory when you're finding the creatures that were the result of evolution way up high and what they what they supposedly evolved from are above them in the fossil record. It, that makes no sense at all. So dinosaurs and their ancestors, now they're saying live side by side of fossils show. So that, uh, that doesn't bode well for the theory of evolution. Some of these uh, paleontologists, Dr. Y. Shample's coming up and seeing he's published all these books. And he says, look, from, from my reading of the fossil record of dinosaurs, no direct ancestors have been discovered for any dinosaur species. Alas, my list of dinosaurian ancestors is an empty one. And here's Dr. Viol, one of the leading experts in the world of pterosaurs, who says, we know nothing, very little about the pterosaurs. Their ancestors are not known. When they first appear in the geological record, they were completely perfect. They were perfect pterosaurs. You guys, that doesn't make sense that we can have hundreds of pterosaurs discovered in the fossil record. And when you push evolutionists to say, well, what did they evolve from? And they say, uh, we don't know. They just show up in the fossil record as complete pterosaurs and they can't find where they evolved from. That puts evolution dead on the water right there. The other thing that's, that's scary for evolutionists is that you go into museums nowadays and say, well, we know what happened to the dinosaurs. They didn't go extinct. They, they devolved into birds and chickens. Well, then why do we find modern birds like cormorants, ducks, owls, uh, 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 seagulls, all types of birds are found in dinosaur species. In fact, there's now a list of up to 120 bird species found in the Mesozoic. It doesn't make any sense. It has no credibility to say that dinosaurs evolved into birds if they're buried with birds. Complete, perfectly formed birds with flapping wings the whole bit. Now, given some of the birds in the, in the Cretaceous, and in the, the layers beneath them look do look different. We have, there's been a lot of bird extinction, but we also have modern looking birds. Ducks are still ducks, owls are still owls, and cormorants are still cormorants straight in the dinosaur layers. So there's no evolution going on there either. Now let's talk about some speculation. Let's let's talk about dragons. Now, if you're not convinced already with with some of the tour that we've taken. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that there's much more convincing that, that can be done for the skeptics that are still out there. So I'm going to add this as, as, as purely speculative additional evidence. You could take this evidence and throw it away. I don't need it for my faith. It's not going to tip the scales for me. For me, I find it interesting, and, uh, but it's, it's not going to tear at the tapestry of my faith if these dragon dinosaur myths aren't true. But I do find a number of them 
convincing. I think a lot of them are speculation. I think a lot of them are fakes, myths and legends that have no bearing in, in real history at all. But some of them for me are spooky real, and there's too many of them for me to disregard all of them. So we'll go on and see what uh, what I mean. Here's a, a clip from, uh, from the Discovery Channel uh, movie called Dragons. And they say, there's one creature remembered in the legends of almost every human culture that ever existed. A creature depicted with remarkable similarity by the Chinese, the Aztecs, and even the Inuit who live in a frozen land where no reptiles are found, even if they have stories of this animal. Cultures from different continents, people who had no contact with each other, yet all of them have stories describing the same mythical animal. That's from a secular site. It's a secular admission, and I would agree wholeheartedly, yes. Somehow, ancient histories and cultures from every continent were talking about, drawing, having oral histories and written histories and cave drawings of creatures that looked very similar and creatures that they were calling dragons that looked a lot like dinosaurs. Here's a clip from Live Science. This is all of the creatures that ever lived Pterosaurs probably most closely resemble the dragons of European legend. Reptilian and featherless pterosaurs flew on wings of hide that were supported by a single long, long bony finger. I agree with that too. If you go back and look at these dragon myths and legends, there are way too many pterosaur sightings and reportings and myths and legends for these creatures not to have lived after the flood. The Native Americans called them thunderbirds. Uh, you go in England and Wales, they had all kinds of stories of these flying creatures coming down and wreaking havoc, lots of legends. So here is the worldwide pterosaur distribution that we find them in all three Mesozoic layers and we find them all over the world. And I find that fascinating because if there was a worldwide flood that lasted for 370 days, wouldn't it make sense that these creatures could get caught up in the thermals and glide and fly for weeks or months while the flood was going on until they gave up and bought it. Because remember, God says everything outside of the ark is going to die. And that's why we have these creatures that are buried in all three different layers of the Mesozoic. And we see they look like dragons. When you look at their, their jaws and their teeth, they look an awful lot like dragons. And some of them probably got off the ark, reproduced, and lived after the flood. Here's one called Dracorex hogwartsia. That's from the Hell Creek Formation uh, in central South Dakota. What does this creature look like to you? You know, it's got little arms up in front. It's got scary looking jaw and some horns and a couple jaws in the back. Well, it looks an awful lot like a dragon uh, about what people would say dragons look like. There's a, there's a, a common theme and some morphology of dragon types. And we see here's a real skeleton fossil of a creature that looks a lot like what they were saying creatures look like in med medieval times, like these dragons looked like. So there's the skull close up. It looks exactly like you would think a dragon would look with the two horns in the top, horns up on its nose, a big jaw, scary looking dragon. And here's an ancient uh, drawing of a dragon looks awfully similar to this creature. That's an 800 year old tapestry. I'm not saying that that species was this, th th that dragon was this species, but maybe there was something that looked an awful lot like it. How did these, th these uh, Chinese folks know how to draw a dragon that had three fingers or, or three or four fingers and toes like that and a long tail, scales, a couple horns up on its head. Very, very interesting how um, anatomically correct they were able to draw these creatures. So we don't really need this dragon evidence and we can't go back and verify any of these things. So again, these are speculations. I'm not gonna hang my hat on them, but if you go back and look at dragons in history, there's not dozens, not just a hundred, there's hundreds and hundreds of myths, legends, drawings, historical accounts, even ancient military records that talk about mankind encountering these dragon dinosaur looking creatures. Lots and lots and lots of them from most every people group around the world.
But I think, uh, again, all of these claims, I think, are supplementary. So here is a quick map of what the, uh, what the world looks like. We've got dragon legends and myths that are all over the place here. If you just take one little place, the United Kingdom on this map here, that one little area, you would think we've all heard of maybe two or three dragon legends. Well, it's actually 81. There's 81 locations in Britain where dinosaur dragon activity has been reported or remembered. You guys, that's way too many for me to just believe they're all based on one myth or two or three. Something was going on in medieval times around that region that bred legend after legend after myth after myth of these dragon-like creatures, 81 different accounts of them. So I think what's going on is you have a lot of them, you've got dragon myths, and you've got some carvings and lots of paintings and legends, you've got some military accounts. There are all kinds of these, hundreds and hundreds of them. I think a lot of them are fake. I think they're made up stories and legends. Some guy wanted to get popular or make up a scary story about some swamp or whatever. I think a lot of them are fake. Maybe some of them have some truth uh, in them, but I think a lot of them do have some truth and if you go back and, and and drill into it you'll find some of the stories just seem a lot more credible than others and i think we can go back to some ancient historians to find out which accounts to pay attention to so on the left of this column here you'll see six famous renowned historians guys like marco polo alexander the great cassius deo Anathasius uh, Kircher, Pliny the Elder, Herodotus. You know, we've all heard of these people. You learn about them in history class. Marco Polo, famous guy. We've got the travels of Mar Marco Polo for him, from him. You know, what is it that these guys have in common? Well, all of them talked about dragons. Not as mythical creatures, but these people talked about dragons as real creatures living and engaging and having encounters with mankind in the regions that they talked about. Here's the ones from Marco Polo. He got around quite a bit. He's traveling all over uh, the world here on his journeys, going around for a couple different decades. Very famous historical explorer. We've got these incredible maps uh, called the Fraumero map. Uh, from 1450 that he drew it's a lot of it is really accurate to what we know about the world today he's going around mapping these places talking with people in these different regions hundreds of years ago and he has all kinds of interesting stories about dragons and dinosaurs he you know he this guy popularized the 4,000 mile silk road this is this guy is no joke he's going out there doing doing good history and uh, he, he's coming up with stories like this he says, in the province named Karajan, here are found snakes and huge serpents, 10 paces in length at 10 spans of girth, or 50 feet long and about 100 inches around. But at the fore part of these snake-like creatures near the head, they have two short legs, very much like a theropod, uh, each with three claws. Now we're really getting into theropod world here, as well as eyes larger than a loaf of bread and very glaring. The, jar, the jaws are wide enough to swallow a man, the teeth are large and sharp, and their whole appearance is so formidable that neither man nor any kind of animal can approach them without terror. Others are of smaller size, being eight, six, or five paces long. And he goes on and talks about how people were killing these creatures. Here we have all the way over in the Amazon rainforest, the pigments in this drawing have been carbon dated to 3,300 years old. So these, these people who were drawing this cave drawing in an Amazon rainforest, kind of a, an enclave underneath a, a cliff. Um, uh, Vance Nelson was responsible for finding this out. You can find his book called Dire Dragons. And I think he's got one specifically on his journey to the Amazon that talks about this. Here we have a whole bunch of different hunters who are obviously holding a spear surrounding what has to be a sauropod dinosaur. Did they make this up? Did they find a skeletal fossil and then make it up? Or were they actually out hunting these creatures in the Amazon rainforest? Here's another one, a scan from a, an ancient temple in Cambodia. They believe these, uh, these drawings are about 900 years old. 
And if you zoom in on some of them on the side of this door here, you see th something that looks an awful lot like a Stegosaurus. It's got plates on its back. It's even got a little horn that comes up on the downside of its ear. Looks to me like someone knew what a Stegosaurus looked like and they carved one into the side of this temple. There's a Stegosaurus, there's a drawing, looks pretty, uh, pretty evident to me. Uh, here's another one that I, I just love. They referred to this, this is a mosaic, a huge mosaic, um, six meters wide by four meters high, done in the first century BC. Uh, it's called the Nile mosaic and they call this creature a crocodile leopard. Well, it doesn't look like an alligator or a croc. It doesn't look like a leopard. It looks like something in between. In fact, it kind of looks like this creature, uh, which they say went extinct in the Triassic. There's a picture, look at the legs, look at the head, the shoulders, the tail. Looks like a very good fitting uh, reproduction of that creature. Here's what it looks like on a close up on its head. They believe it went extinct 250 million years ago. Maybe some lived after the flood and were marked down as, as uh, and drawn of, uh, by, by people hunting them. So if you look at all the different types of dinosaur varieties and kinds, it would be my speculation that these varieties probably did live on past the flood for hundreds of years after the flood, making up all of these dragon myths and legends and accounts that we have. Um, here's another one from Cassius Deo. Isn't this interesting? He says that a dragon suddenly crept up and settled behind the wall of the Roman army. The Romans killed it by the order of Regulus, skinned it, and sent the hide to the Roman Senate. It happened to be 120 feet long and its thickness was fitting to the length. Huge giant creature, that's a military count uh, almost 2,000 years ago. Another one by Kircher here, and he talks about these winged dragons. A dispute has only arisen between authors, most of whom declare them to be fanciful, but these authors are contradicted by histories and eyewitnesses. Winged dragons, small, great, and greatest, have been produced in all times in every land. Amazing uh, testimony there from a respectable historian. Here's one by Herodotus, and he says, winged serpents are said to fly from Arabia at the beginning of the spring, making for Egypt, but the Ebus birds encounter the invaders in the pass and kill them. The serpents are like water snake. Their wings are not feathered, but like very much like the wings of a bat. Certainly something that, uh, that went extinct. We're not sure what creature that is, but sounds like it could be some type of pterosaur. So I think with that, we'll go ahead and, and, and wrap up. I think that's the last slide what we have there, but just a, just a comment that there is, there was one door on the ark and the unique claim about Christ is he says he's the only door, the only way to the heavenly father and that no man will be saved but through him. So if anyone watching this uh, today, has been moved or shifted by this and feels a tugging from the Lord on your heart and on your mind, I would encourage you, you guys, take that step, that leap of faith, go all in, start reading the Bible, start with Genesis 1 and John 1, and just have an attitude that says, I'm going to be open to this. I'm going to read through it. Uh, pray get involved in a local church because I can give you with, with all of my word, all of my witness, all of my honesty that you guys, I've drilled into this stuff for years. It's real. It's not fake. This is not some religion we have to adopt by faith. The God of the Christian Bible has got truth cornered and the Bible is full of it from page to page. So, um, you guys, thank you very much for having me on today. I think we'll, we'll shift to some q and I have about another 15 minutes left, but would love to take some, uh, some Q&A. Well, Dan, I have to say, first of all, excellent presentation. I believe that was probably one of the best presentations on that topic I've ever seen. And oh, uh, many in the audience, we've got over 100 people right now enjoying this excellent talk, Dr. Biddle. And uh, many people in terms of our viewers agree. So Randall Dobbins compliments here. Uh, this has to be the best dinosaurs presentation I've ever seen. And oh, let me remind people, <laughs> I've, I've got our moderator in the chat, Doki Doki Bible Club. Uh, please support the Ark and the Darkness movie project. 
And also, uh, please make sure to subscribe to Genesis Apologetic. So again, Dan, fantastic presentation. Sam, I know uh, you probably agree with me as well. Anything you'd like to add, <laughs> Sam, before no, we... You know, I, I had a bunch of questions, but I mean, that was so thorough. You just wiped them all out. So I, I don't really know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was long. I don't know about thorough, but you guys know what thorough. I mean about the one hour now. It, it's really hard to compress this stuff down to a 20 minute snippet or a one minute thing. But when you really take some time to go through it, it really will lock in as truth. Uh, and our hearts yeah. want to resonate with truth. So... Thanks for, for having me today. I'm, I'm passionate about this stuff. It's a life changing. It was excellent. Amen. Yeah. Amen. To the right. skeptics, you know, that was basically 10 hours worth of information compressed into an hour. And so the evidence is out there as long as you are willing to be objective and to look at it honestly. So, Dan, I appreciate you presenting all of that You're evidence welcome. for us. Okay, so we'll just get into some of these questions then. <laughs> you were comprehensive, Dan. So it's almost like you predicted what a lot of these questions would be and you answered them in your presentation. So great job. We'll throw this question up. Honesty Angel, great. appreciate it. And she's asking, what happened to the dinosaurs after the flood? Great question. So we, we believe that there are probably about 80 to, to 100 different dinosaur kinds or dinosaur families or varieties that were on the ark. So about 200 dinosaurs total, you know, male and female. They got off of the ark after the year long flood. And it's probably the collective creationist community belief that most of them, maybe 50%, 60%, went extinct pretty quickly after the flood because if you got to think about the larger varieties for example they're used to a, a different probably a different ozone layer different climate different temperatures different humidity uh, lots of rich food sources everywhere and these creatures are some of them needed to consume tons of vegetation every day just to live like the large the large sauropods so a lot of them probably died off uh quickly through uh, and went extinct uh, through starvation. Some of them, like the frisky theropods and some of their other varieties, were probably hunted into, into extinction by man. And we see that just for example, there's no more grizzly bears in California because they were hunted into extinction by man because they would go out, the rogue ones, and eat people. So the farmers and ranchers and campers said, no more grizzly bears. We don't like those anymore. So they, they wiped them out. So some of the larger ones were hunted into extinction by man. Some of their food sources were, were, were running out. And they were, they were really suited for the pre-flood world, larger, requiring, you know, uh, a, a lot of food. And after the flood, it was a... Uh, it was a different place, a different climate. So some of them went extinct, but I do believe that some of them, particularly the like, the, for example, the theropods and the pterosaurs likely lived uh, for, for, let's say, 3,000 years after the flood, uh, maybe up to 4,000 years after the flood. I see as I've journeyed through history and ordered a lot of the original old historical books that did have solid accounts of dragons, it real there was a tapering that happened in the in the medieval ages so the 14th 15th century that seemed to be the period where a lot of the the dragon myths and legends just vanished then with the native americans being the last ones in the 1800s they had some pretty credible stories about the thunderbirds which might have been uh, pterosaurs um, but i think they're probably all extinct now i think there's some unexplored areas in the congo maybe where you might be able to find a few uh, but I think they're they're mostly all extinct by now. Yeah, the the word dinosaur, if I understand, it, it's only about two hundred years old. So before yeah, that, it would point. just be a description of a large uh, a large animal. That's a great point. And it, it, it's it was in, invented in eighteen forty one. So yeah, that that's really our taxonomy that we're applying to just animal groups. So I would completely right. agree with you. They're just large large animals. <laughs> so, great point. Right. Before I was even um, a, a creationist, I didn't know in high school that there was a position called Young Earth Creation, Dan. And I was fascinated in high school. I believed in evolution. That's what I was taught. But I was fascinated by these dragon legends and these historical accounts that you've been covering in your bonus material, as, as you put it. <laughs> and so even yeah. before I was a creationist, 
I, I really was just amazed by by those lines of evidence for dragons and dinosaurs. I think we have a God-given instinctive curiosity about those things. Mm -hmm. And what's been one of the most fulfilling things in my life, and this might sound weird to a lot of you out there, is for me to understand, wow, I can believe in that dragon stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's real. A lot of it is real. It was very relieving for me to say they're not myth, you know, fiction and fantasy, a lot of that stuff is real. So when I travel around like Europe or whatever and see some of these stories and accounts, it lodges within my truth frame as a possibility. I don't have to yeah. dismiss it as fantasy. Right. Yeah. One of the rewards of being a creationist. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well said, Dan. Okay. So next question comes in. This is a common one from the critics. And it is, I would say, one of their favorite lines of evidence for large-scale evolution, universal common ancestry. And so the question is, what is your favorite response to evolutionists who argue the ordering in the fossil record is a representative of evolutionary history, right? Where you've got more simple organisms in, in your lower layers up to fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and humans basically on, on your um, highest layers, Dan. Yeah, yeah. So I'll be real honest here. I struggled with that question for years. I bought lots of books about it. In fact, um, if uh, whoever wrote that, if you want to send me an email to dan at genesisapologetics.com, I'll send you the book that I would re, uh, refer to that when I just, the, the name escapes me right now, but I'd be happy to refer to that book. I drilled into this a lot and I found an extremely satisfying answer. The theory of the broadly painting is from creationists is that the animals were buried um, according to their habitat, according to their region, according to their elevation, and according to their body mass, density, and intelligence. There's a lot of factors mixed in there, right? But obviously, if the fountains of the great deep, not the fountains on the land, but the fountains of the great deep happened first, you've got to take all the trilobites and everything that's on the ocean floor that doesn't have the ability to swim, that has to, by logic, be the very bottom most layers. And that's exactly what we see. We see all those bottom dwellers, they're gone, they're buried, and they're their deepest in the fossil record, which is exactly what we would expect. And then you go on up and then you have mammals and finally man. There's a... a um, a video that we just made a few months ago called Why Don't We Find Humans in uh, Buried with Dinosaurs that goes into this fossil layer record uh, for 20, 30 minutes, and it goes deep into this, this subject, answering the question, yeah, why don't we typically find humans buried right next to a T-Rex? But if you just look at what's going to happen during the flood and you map out the flood process and its different sequences, you're going to see the underwater stuff's going to buy it first. They're going to get buried. They have no hope and they can't go anywhere. So mobility is one of the burial factors that I talked about. Mobility, density, and intelligence. So all that stuff goes first. What's going next? Well, shallow seas. They're all going to go next. And then what next? Swamplands like the Jurassic and the Jurassic layers. They're going to get it next. What's going to be the very, very top? The things that can run and the things that are smart and light and can travel. You know, remember, if, if the flood was, it didn't happen overnight, it was 150 days from the commencement of the flood all the way over to the zenith of the flood, 150 day process. If you're human, or, or if you're a, a, a cougar or a lion or a bear or a dog, and you you see the marshlands getting wiped out, you see tsunamis coming in, and you're mobile and you can travel 20 miles a day, where are you going? <laughs> the high hills. You're going to bury it last, but even, even more explanatory, you're not going to be buried at all. What's going to happen to the creatures that can go higher? They're going to float, bloat, and drown. So they're going to drown, then they're going to float and bloat, and then what's going to happen to the body parts? They're just going to disintegrate and float down to the bottom and not even be buried, or they're going to be buried offshore with what's called the Tejas runoff. So I would say that the, the order of fossil burial is when you really drill into it, it looks scary at first, like, oh my gosh, they've got this order or order of progression. It looks like it fits vertical evolution. looks like they, they've got me cornered. But to the scholar, 
when you dig, dig into the fossil data yourself, go to PaleoDB and start tracking it out and looking at it and look at some of these books I can refer you to, you'll come away overwhelmingly convinced, oh my gosh, the flood best describes the order of burial it has nothing to do with vertical evolution. So that's another answer that I think takes some while a while to look into. It's not a it's not a quick answer, but I think the order of burial in the fossil record sides with us and supports our case more than evolution. And again, send me an email. I'll be happy to refer you to that um, that book. I think it was by Dwayne Gish, but uh, I'll I'll look it up and and send it on to whoever's curious about it. Hey, Amen. Well said, Doctor Dan. Have you heard of the Ashley phosphate beds? Is it in North or South Carolina? No, I haven't heard of those. Uh -uh. There, I mean, they. I guess there is a record of finding human and dinosaur bones uh, remains together in the big death burial bed. It's miles long. Which Amazing. Send, send me an email on that. I'd love to see it. Please yeah, do. Okay. okay. It's called the Ashley Phosphate Beds? Yeah, that's right. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll uh, send me a note on that. I'd love to look it up. Okay. Great. And Dan, I, I love your answer. I completely agree. You know, basically the order of the fossils is the burial order of the flood in terms of communities, habitats. And so if the flood with the founds of the yeah. Great Deep started in the ocean, you'd have marine creatures being buried on the continents, followed by your land creatures. And, you know, your your uh, humans basically would represent uh, post-flood humans. But excellent answer. I appreciate you taking <laughs> uh, what could be a long answer and, and condensing it into yeah. a great explanation. Sure. Okay. So as, as we wind down here, this one comes in from Mountain Hours. Appreciate the support. And he's asking, this has to do with your uh, dinosaur soft tissue slides. Amazing evidence for young earth creation, uh, Dr. Biddle. And Mountain Hours asks, how many cases of soft tissue in dinosaur bones have they found so far? Well, let's see. They have it in sauropods, hadrosaurs, T-Rexes, uh, and several other different species. But some of the bigger finds have been of from the large bone creatures because the bigger the bones typically preserve those soft tissues for longer. <clears throat> I know the article database exceeds 120. 58 of those articles are specifically involving dinosaurs. And those 58 might be describing each an individual case or multiple cases. So... I could refer uh, this individual to that list to look them up to, to answer the question, the number of soft tissue cases or instances. Um, but you guys, I, I got to say a little bit colloquially here, if you find bones in the top layers of the Cretaceous, and we've done this several times, and send it in for collagen analysis, you're very likely to find soft tissue. It's not a very rare thing to do. Um, I buy bones from private ranchers frequently from Montana and ship them in for analysis. And you guys, it's it's incredible how fresh looking these bones are. They have Haversian tubes to them. They've got all kinds of evidence that they're that they're still bones. They they come back after they bounce. Uh, microscope spectrometry off of them and they come back as hydroxyapatite which is bone you know bone mineral um, so i would refer you to that list to get the specific number of cases but i would say from my from my exposure to this field and i'm working with several phd uh, paleontologist, one of which uh, Brian Thomas has his PhD yep. in paleochemistry and has done a lot of work in this area. Um, he could answer that more precisely, but I'm working with these guys and the bones I send them and the investigations that they do, it's more prevalent than you would think. Yeah, Dr. Mark Armitage, um, he said he's looking forward to finding something in the trilobites. So that'll be interesting when that happens. Oh, great. I love <laughs> Mark's work. Say. Yeah. Uh, and, and speaking of that, I mean, what would you say? Do they do they currently have an explanation, some sort of um, you know a magical preservation mechanism to explain <laughs> this soft tissue? You know, I it, it's 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 uh, it's almost embarrassing uh, for them that they don't, uh, and they've tried, and the 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 times that they've tried is just 
it's 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 just embarrassing and I, I don't want to go into all the details but they actually tried in peer review journals to say it was contamination from lab technician makeup that was one right. attempt to to write it off the other one was oh well maybe an ostrich died on top of the t-rex and leached its collagen into the bone and then they disproved that one and mary schweitzer did great work proving nope that what we're seeing is organic at the molecular level to the bone we're studying Oh. So a bunch of uh, attempts have been made, but they're they're just not not suiting. There have been some explanations about why they pre allegedly find these blood cells preserved, and that's due to the iron that might be leaching in from the water. And they've done some studies with uh, with uh, with blood that make that show it can last for a couple of years, you know. But then they infer sixty five million years. Very very weak science. Big inferences being being made there. Great response. Um, Dr. Biddle, are, are you familiar with this common evolutionary, I guess, criticism to the dinosaur soft tissue? They'll talk about how Mary Schweitzer, she's an old earth creationist, and they'll argue that she, f she discovered this dinosaur uh, soft tissue with the T-Rex, and yet she maintains an old earth. And so they argue this is contradictory to basically the way we argue for uh, red blood cells, dinosaur soft mm. tissue. What are your thoughts on that? What would be a good response to um, something like that? So let me come from a 30,000 mile perspective and drop a, an earth penetrating torpedo on, on top of that whole discussion. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know, Mary. I, I bet Mary's a very competent scientist. She does. She's the number one published author in this field on, on paleo chemistry. Uh, respect her as a professional. But what I mean about the torpedo is simply this. Let's just make this easy. Go back 50 years and survey every single leading paleontologist in the world and say, hey, do you think someday we'll find a dinosaur bone that will have these like 16 fresh bio diff organic materials in it, like collagen, blood, cell blood cells, blood vessels, everything else? I bet every single one of them would say that is impossible are you kidding me and then you go and look at what happened to mary schweitzer's reviewers they said well we're never going to publish these findings and when when mary would ask them well, what would convince you that i'm finding these materials i'm sending you pictures of and their quote back was nothing i'll never be convinced Right. So it's it's so deeply uh, you know ingrained in the evolutionary mindset that these bones are are mineralized relics and artifacts of some ancient distant past that they're never going to shift their paradigm and view. But what the data says is that the timeline should move from here to here. You know, it it should be shortened. The timeline, the data, the research results says you have to go out from 65 million years ago and bring them back to about 4,000 years ago. Then magically, all 16 bioorganic materials align with truth. And no one's having to do this cognitive dissonance thing now where they believe 65 million years, but they see the fresh dinosaur tissues and they've got all this friction being generated from those two things that can't exist at the same time. But right. if you just take the, the, the findings and align them with the young earth, there's no friction because all of this stuff lines up. I, I was put in front of 30 zoology students once by a professor whose name was Charles Darwin. It was Charles Daly Dar or Darwin Daly, but he went by Charles Darwin. And he thought he was going to make fun of me in front of these 30 zoology students. And he almost sent me out of the classroom when I simply said to them, your guys' own science book says that this collagen that we're finding in dinosaur bone and study after study after study shouldn't exist and can't exist by medical science, cannot be there, yet it's there. How do you explain it? And there is no explanation. There's no way collagen can last 70 times longer than all of these scientific studies have shown this the half-life the half to be. It's impossible. It's, it's like saying that I can throw a chicken leg out in, out in the mud, out, out in my backyard and dig it up 65 million years later and find <laughs> collagen still in it. It's ridiculous. Right. And people who have rational sense about them know it doesn't pass the smell test. You shouldn't be finding collagen in bones that are petrified rocks that are 65 million years old. 
So, you know, when I hear, oh, they found this or iron preserves it for two years or whatever, I'm just like, you guys really need to just do a gut check on what you're trying to, <laughs> to say to me here and start from a higher perspective and just go paleontologist 50 years ago would never have expected this because it doesn't fit the paradigm. So when people say they can stretch it out and make it last for a couple of years or whatever, they're kind of missing the, the, the big picture. Yeah, they have well, a uh, worldview that they're trying to protect, and that worldview yes. doesn't include the God who loves them, and they they will fight against that with everything they have, and it's sad. Exactly. Yep, it is sad. Well, like you said, they go into their interpretation of, of this data with that yeah. basic starting point that evolution happened, the earth is old, and so that's a great response, Dr. Biddle. Again, I have to thank you for your time. You're always so generous uh, with your time for these presentations. I know how busy you are. Again, your ministry, Genesis Apologetics, has been a huge blessing to us and so many. And so I want to encourage everybody in the chat to go uh, subscribe to Genesis Apologetics. They're putting out some great material. I want to recommend uh, your video you put out just recently on Leviathan. It's doing incredibly well. So anybody who has not yet seen that specific video, definitely check it out. So Dan, great. again, thank you for this presentation. Thank you for your time thank for you the Q&A. And I'd like to hand it over to you if you had some final words or final thoughts. You guys, thank you very much for having me on to this. And, and I would just reiterate, this is not a secondary issue. It's not a tertiary issue. When, when you discover that God's word is truthful and you can take your head and align it with your heart, that 18 inch separation between your mind and your heart and align them. When, when, when God allowed me to discover the truth of young earth just eight or nine short years ago, it was like being born again, again for me. All of a sudden, all these doubts and these little spinny, mysterious, clouded areas I had in my heart and mind just were gone. They vanished. And I understand, wow, God, you want me to trust your word from the beginning. And when I did, my faith grew new roots and it revitalized my faith and my life. So I would encourage anyone um, to just, just take that step of faith. Take God's word like a child. Jesus says you can't enter the, the kingdom of heaven unless you enter it like a little child. Regard God's word in that same way. Approach it with holiness and reverence. And uh, if God says that he did it in six days, like he says in the fourth commandment, no less, you know, God says, for in six days it created the earth, the heavens, the sea, that all that is, that is in them. You know, um, what was God trying to communicate? Well, he wanted us to believe and understand there were six ordinary days. And I think when you put your life under that submission and under authority, and then you follow that authority through the rest of scripture, then God's word can have the authority and the power to act in your life and begin permeating your life and your fruitfulness will increase, your faith walk will increase, your joy will increase. Um, this whole young earth thing is a life transforming uh, you know, a thing that can happen to people. And I pray it happens to uh, more and more of your viewers as well. Well, great final words and final thoughts. Dr. Biddle, you've demonstrated uh, tonight that it really is a great time to be a biblical creationist. The evidence yeah. is overwhelming, I have to say. Oh, Sam, appreciate you uh, joining us thanks, uh, today as co-host. Any final thoughts, final words, brother? Yeah, Donnie, brother, uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, Dr. Biddle, that was an excellent presentation, and I thank you very much. And um, thank you. yeah, for the critics, I mean, here we are again, another wake up call. Um, Jesus is coming. So, Amen. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, guys. God bless okay. the both of you. And, and let's God come bless. on before the flood movie comes out in about a year. Noah'sflood.com. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. Dan, Sam, God bless to the audience. God thanks bless, for guys. tuning in, and we'll talk soon.